the 1780s, you get people like Sir William Jones founding the Royal Asiatic Society. They discover Sanskrit. The first Sanskrit texts, like the Gita, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, are all translated. The discovery of the Buddha as an Indian figure takes place shortly after that. The translation of the Ashoka Brahmani script and the discovery of the Mauryan Empire, the Buddha, the, all this ancient Indian history is explored in the 1780s and transmitted back to Europe where there's a terrific excitement, rather more excitement in France and Germany initially than in Britain, where people like Rousseau and Voltaire are terrifically excited by the discovery of what they see as a living classical culture. This generation are brought up by uh, the Greek and the Latin classics, as so many were before them in Europe. Uh, and when in Hindu India, with the Gita and so on, they find a living classical culture. This is the Iliad and the Odyssey, but it's not dead. The, 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 the bards are still alive. The language is still there. The culture is still going. And this causes terrific excitement across Europe in the 1780s. But it all begins to transform and to change as the 19th century progresses. As British power increases, so does British arrogance. And so does British sense of self and a British, a very old and very traditional sense of British racism. If you look at the wills in the East India Company Library, which are now in the British Museum, British Library, you find for the 1780s that one in three British men are leaving all their goods to an Indian woman. 1780, it's one in three. In other words, one in three British households in India is multicultural, multi-ethnic, with children of mixed race and probably mixed religion. But by 1800, it's down to one in four. By 1810, it's one in five. By 1820, it's one in seven. By 1830, it's almost over. By 1840, there are no Indian women mentioned in any official wills of the company. So you move in 60 years from a world where there is one in three households, religiously and ethnically mixed, to almost complete apartheid. Today, we kind of believe that the more different races live together, the more they intermarry, the more they understand each other, the more understanding there will be. But as this period shows, multiculturalism has got a reverse gear, as well as a variety of forward gears. And this period would form a very worrying precedent for what could happen today if the Fox News and the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail's uh, spread poison about race and religion and ethnicity. The reversal in the, uh, in the multiculturalism and the interest in India is powered not just by British power, but a second factor, and this is the change in religious attitudes. In the 18th century, there is a, a very sort of generous deism in British Christianity, but by the early 19th century, a far more intolerant form of evangelical Christianity is spreading in London. Starting in Clapham, you're moving in, the world, in Britain from the world of Johnson and Boswell, with Boswell whoring his way through the brothels of Pall Mall and what have you, and Hogarth's Gin Alley and, and all that kind of stuff, to by the 1830s, the world of the mid-Victorian chapel, where everyone's idea of a good time is to go and listen to a five-hour long evangelical sermon in a chapel in Clapham the kind of alpha course of its day. And this is exported to India, but with the additional, with the additional factor of the, um, the evangelicals seeing the conquest of India by the British as part of God's plan for the conversion of India. Charles Grant is the first evangelical to reach the position of director of the company. And he writes, could it be that we were given our empire in India only that we might draw an annual profit from it? No. We were given it so that we might bring the light of truth to the poor benighted heathen. So suddenly there's a change in attitude. The empire is not there because of the Industrial Revolution, because of better trading practices and better artillery. It's there because God gave it to the British so that they might convert Indians to the Church of England. And you find collectors in the 1820s and 1830s erecting Bustani and Urdu and Persian um, Ten Commandments outside their residences. You find colonels lecturing their Brahmin sepoys on the New Testament at parade grounds. And all this creates a feeling of huge anxiety among the Indians, particularly when it becomes more and more virulent and the language changes in the 1830s and 1840s. The Reverend Ridgely Jennings moves into the um, 
the uh, Lahore Gate of the Red Fort. And he begins to publish from there these incredibly virulent anti-Hindu and anti-Muslim pamphlets, which he helpfully translates into Urdu and Persian and distributes through the bazaars of Delhi, saying that Hinduism is a backward, vile, and primitive and lascivious religion, that Islam is the religion of the devil, that the Mughal is the last Mughal's palace, is the last bastion of the prince of darkness, and so on. Deeply offensive. What's more, a change in the company's charter brought about by Wilberforce changes the um, charter of the company to allow the missionaries not only to exist on British soil in India, but to flourish, linking, em empowering and compelling the company to support the missionaries. So for 300 years, you have a situation where the company keeps a very clear, 250 years, a very clear distinction between itself and the missionaries. But by the 1830s, that's changing. The company starts building churches in every cantonment and every civil lines in India. Today, when you go around those cantonments and civil lines, all those little white Pugines churches exist from between about 1830 and 1850. When, um, at this period, you find the governor of the Northwest Provinces is made the chairman of the Delhi Mission. So this distinction, which has been carefully maintained between church and state, between church and company at least, breaks down. And enough vocal evangelicals are there in company employment, talking about the conversion of India and the forcible conversion of India to alarm Hindus and Muslims to believe that the company is out to convert them. And some indeed are. It's not a misplaced anxiety. They are always a small minority, but they're extremely vocal. And this creates shockwaves throughout. And there are a number of things which add to this. For example, in Agra, a mosque is given to the missionaries and it's turned into a church. Throughout uh, much of North India, the land that's used for building these new churches is taken from temples, Sufi shrines, and mosques. The old endowments are cancelled, and they're given uh, to the missionaries. All of which creates a great climate of anxiety, which reaches its peak in 1856 with the introduction of a new rifle. The company had used for 100 years the old... Um, uh, the old musket, which had been in use since the, the, the brown best, since the time of Culloden. It's smooth-barreled uh, and uh, it, wildly inaccurate. The company, following the example of Tipu, introduces a rifle in 1856. Uh, the, the barrel is rifled with curvilinear striations, making the ball turn in the barrel, which makes it uh, have a far more accuracy and a far longer range. But this is the age of muzzle loaders, and it's far more of a struggle to get a ball down a rifle barrel than a smooth barrel. So the balls come in a cartridge pre-lubricated in a clog of lubricant. Now, the company could have chosen some delicious unguent from the body shop or L'Occitane en Provence, some linseed oil or beeswax or olive oil or God knows what. But instead, with a kind of sensitivity which had come to mark the company at this period, they chose a mixture of pig fat and cow fat, which was richly offensive to every single uh, uh, Indian sepoy they controlled and had trained, and which um, also tasted disgusting for their British sepoys, who also hated this rifle. So... This is considered to be so fantastically offensive and cack-handed that, again, many of the troops assume it cannot be an accident, that this is part of this wider conspiracy to take their caste, to ritually pollute them and insult them prior to converting them by force to Christianity. This is, in fact, completely a myth. It is a cock-up rather than a deliberate policy. But it comes along with enough other stuff that this is widely believed. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, the, um, the Delhi court is still going about its, its stuff. The painter's Gula Mali Khan is painting the Nawab of Laharu here. Nawab of Jaja, that is, sorry. Dancing girls are dancing, dressing up in this fantastic kit that was still cut a, a, a dash in, uh, in, in uh, Prince William's nightclub, or oh, Annabelle's today, I'm sure. Here is the kind of Keith Richards of the period. This is... Uh, uh, the great uh, blind sitar player of uh, Zaffa's court. The miniature painters are crossing old mogul techniques of detail with Western botanical prints to produce new hybrids. 